something that I like to um, talk about a lot is evolutionary storytelling. And that is like Darwinism, you know, what storytelling traits survive? You know, um, what uh, archetypes, what features, what aspects of story remain through all the years? Because we've seen so many shifts in the expression of storytelling. We've gone from this all the way to this, and yet what remains the same? Today is the most interesting time for storytellers because platforms are changing. Uh, are changing, and, and, they're, and they're so interesting that we're called to do so many things at once. We are called to imagine stories big enough for IMAX and small enough for our mobile phones. Yes, the craft is growing up. So I'm gonna break this down into three major components. Um, first, I'm gonna talk to you about good versus evil, right? Something you're all very much familiar with. And I'm gonna talk about where this is going. Um, Next, I'm going to talk about the digital image and where I think that is going. And the last thing I'll talk about is interactivity. And I think you'll find that very, very interesting. So good versus evil, right? Uh, this is an ancient concept. And I think that the core ingredient of every good story, from any perspective, is this eternal clash of these two energies, right? Good versus bad. Um, it's ancient, and I think that, um, that there must have been some guy, well, here's the thing. Um, when two wrestlers would come up against each other in, in, in a sandy you know, ground, and, and they were all like oiled up, and there were, there were both of them, both of them were like the best that the culture had to offer, and you would watch them. What if one of these fighters represents the values that you represent, and the other fighter represents the values that threaten you. All of a sudden, you, the audience, become more than observers. All of a sudden, you're asking the fundamental story question, what will happen next? And that question, the question that births story, is only born because of this eternal duality that defines us as a human species. Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort, Snow White and the evil witch, Batman and the Joker, Moses and Pharaoh, Simba and Scar, Tweety, Sylvester, St. George and the Dragon, Three Little Pigs and the Big Bad Wolf. You know what? The David and Goliath um, syndrome it is pretty much the only filter by which we, as a mature, civilized society, still perceive the world. And that has also become the rhetoric of, of media, of, of history. It makes so much sense to us as a storytelling species to define things as good and bad. You know, Steve Jobs versus Bill Gates, Republicans versus Democrats, America versus terrorism, or communism, or communism again, Coke versus Pepsi, rich versus poor, left brain versus right brain, science versus religion. We have constructed a consciousness that is so polarized that it makes sense that this becomes a representation of all the stories that we tell. This makes sense because if you take this in a more psychoanalytic perspective, our sensory and psychosexual experiences are all centered around dualities, pain versus pleasure, reward versus punishment, wish versus an obstacle, day, night, man, woman, hot and cold, the world of known and the world of the unknown, life and death. Good and evil links back evolutionarily to our most primal instinct. Don't get eaten. But I'm here not to tell you how important good and evil is, but, but I'm here to uh, discuss where it's going. I really, really think that good and evil is boring. And I don't mean that, I don't mean to like shy away from centuries of thought, but you know what, human consciousness is only like hundreds of thousands of years old. We need to grow up, we need to move on. We need to find new platforms of expression and we need to move away from this polarity. I think story is a good way to kickstart our intellectual shift from good versus evil to other things. We're gonna see more films like this. We're gonna read more stories like this and the wars of the future will be fought using weapons like this. I think that the future of polarity 
and the future of good and evil is going to boil down to two major things, um, terms that I've come up with for lack um, of better ones. The hybrid hero and the equitale. Here's what they are. The hybrid hero is going to be the hero of the next thousand years. The hybrid hero is a hero who inhabits good and evil, but they both exist inside of him. I think that the era of, of like the, the bad guy standing in a mountain and be like, ha, 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 I'm going to rule the world, that's gone. Because we've, we've, we need to grow up, we need to emancipate from that. We're going to see good and evil as expressions in one human being. My favorite film is Lawrence of Arabia. If you've seen that movie, you'll know that Lawrence is your hero, of course, but who is the bad guy? The bad guys are manifestations of what Lawrence does. Because ultimately, Lawrence is both good and evil. I think that the hybrid hero is going to completely revolutionize the way that we think about the hero's journey. Because it's not going to be, you know, he's not going to cross a border into a magical forest. He's going to cross a border within himself. And all of a sudden, we're not going to see good and evil as light and dark, or as, you know, the, the shining bright hero and then the evil villain. We're going to see more symbolic, subtle expressions of these forces within somebody's mind. And I also think that the future of good and evil is going to evolve into what I call the equitale. And the equitale is uh, it's going, to be, it's going to be a story um, that is told objectively, and it's going to present to you two conflicting forces, and then you get to decide who the hero and the villain is. The Prestige by Chris Nolan is such a film, because you get two heroes who are both hybrid heroes. They're both good and evil in their own ways, but then based on who you are, you decide who to root for. Ultimately, the, the way that I see the future of good and evil is in a more participatory way. So far, the story decides who you root for. From now on, you decide who to root for. This all comes down to the fact that you participate in the future of storytelling. The second thing I want to talk to you about as far as future goes is digital image, right? This is Marty Scorsese holding an iPhone, not feeling very happy about it. Um, back in 1959, um, long before I was thought of, um, there was um, a French new wave um, in cinema. A couple of filmmakers, um, namely Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, looked at cinema the way it was, and they defined cinema as cinéma du papa. That means cinema of the father. You know, with dated production values, with big, fancy, expensive Hollywood lights. Cinema was an art that belonged to the rich. What the French New Wave did was it finally gave a voice to filmmakers who wanted to grab their cameras and go, this was 59, by the way. Film was very, very expensive. But the French New Wave gave voice to all these independent filmmakers, and they, they grabbed their cameras and without much budget, and they would go out in the streets and film. You know, the, the, the director's chair with all the lights and, and, and the whole allure and magic of Hollywood ultimately subsided to a more personal, vibrant, an urgent way of storytelling, and beautiful films like this, or this, or this, were made. <sighs> the French New Wave was sort of the predecessor to what is happening today with this. This is the ultimate weapon for the filmmaker of today. This is the first camera I ever had, and you know what? When I wanted to make my first movies, I didn't have to rely on the director's chair, on the big lights, and on the system. I could grab it, go out in the streets, and film things, whatever inspired me. This is freeing. This is the second camera I own. This is the Canon XLH1, beautiful piece of machinery. And this is the camera I currently own, the Canon 5D. This is an amazing piece of machinery. Um, it renders out amazing HD footage, you know, for, for it's so cheap too. But the idea of this is filmmaking now belongs to us, the people. It's not so much confined in the studios controlled by the rich. It's sort of like our rebellious move against that. 
And you know, the, the system technology always helps us. You know, remember flip cams or remember like digital cameras? It's, we have become a culture where it makes sense to record and document everything that we experience. And of course, the mothership, everything, the iPhone. iPhone is power. When I pull out my iPhone and I record something that I find interesting, all of a sudden, I'm outsourcing my memory. This is more than just recording things that are funny or taking pictures of my food and Instagramming them. This is more of a weapon. This is my way of interacting with the world. And this is my means of storytelling now. If something looks interesting, I will just go at it and take a picture of Peter right here. Boom. I just shortcutted myself through the entire process of pre-production, production, post-production, post distribution, everything, because the power is in your hands. And you know what? This digital shift of everybody filming has contaminated Hollywood. Have you seen this film, Cloverfield? It, and a bunch of other films like The Blair Witch Project or, or Wreck? These films are filmed the way you would film them, right? Because all of a sudden, when you watch those films, you feel like you've done them. This is a very strange sense of faux empowerment. This is one of my favorite shows. If you really watch it, the way that it's filmed and framed, the camera will zoom out, it will shake, it will interact. Because our culture, this is, this is unprecedented, our culture has affected the way that Hollywood films stories. We're going to see more and more stories told as if you had made them, right? And that is brilliant. The story is happening without you. It's literally, it's as if you're walking and something interesting happens and you're like, oh, I'm gonna film that, why not? The story exists whether you do or not. Shooting principle, just point and shoot. Keep it simple, stupid. Just point, shoot, make it clear and simple. Mistakes are mandatory. You have to have the shakes, the distractions, because it's expected, it's our culture now. The story must not see you, you are still a witness. You have to remain detached, you have to remain filming. And of course, as with our postmodern mayhem context, is irrelevant. Eyewitness storytelling is going to be the way of the future, ultimately because you have shaped that. I'm gonna pitch this to you real quick. This is an idea that I have for a TV show. Um, that I think will be something that will happen in the future. I think that in the future, um, the way that TV shows are gonna work is they're gonna have an interaction happen, let's say a table full of people, and they'll hire people, like maybe from a selection process, whatever, and they're gonna arm them with cell phones, and they're gonna sit around and just film whatever they want. And then all of a sudden, that goes on TV, and it's a TV show directed by you, and then you feel like you've made it because you have. And that is just beautiful, because it, it makes you feel, again, that you participate. And that is the future of storytelling. That's some time, right? The last thing, and the most interesting thing that I want to talk to you about, is the future of storytelling in terms of user interactivity. And I think that the best way for me to do that is to actually take a few steps back and take a look at how everything has evolved in terms of our um, interaction with it. So when the movie theater and the cinema first came out, you had little participation over what you would see. Going to the movies was more like an event. You would dress up, uh, you know, put your tie on, get your wife and kids, sit in the movie theater and enjoy. Then the multiplex came out, you know what that is, you, you could open up a newspaper and select which film you were gonna watch. All of a sudden, you were more active in your participation with the story because you had power of choice. This went on for a few decades, and then all of a sudden we saw television. Now that was the ultimate beacon of participation for you because you had power in your hands to shut somebody up, to change a channel, to make somebody loud or quiet. We crave participation with story. And history only shows this. When the VHS 
came along. I was actually fortunate uh, to be around for the last couple of years of that. More power came into our hands as participatory beings. We could all of a sudden watch our favorite scene again and again and again. This was wild back in the day because we crave this sense of control over the stories we watch. And of course, the internet gives us a way of participating with the story. It, it, it empowers us to sort of, you know, be so immersed in the content. We could all of a sudden share, like, comment, pause, view, create. I think that the pattern of participation so far, from the first movie theater until now, shows, that, shows us that we crave participation. So what's next? And I'm going to close with this, because you'll find this very, very interesting. I think that what comes next is the invention of an entirely new platform. It's not a movie. It's not a TV. It's not, not any sort of, of video playing system. But it's something else. And I'm very excited to tell you that I've been working on an idea for the last four or so years called Sync. And Sync is a new system that is going to allow you to control the story. Have you ever watched a movie thinking, oh, well, what if that had happened? Or what if it had ended that way? Well, this is your chance. I think that as a way this is more suggestive than prognostic, I know, but you know, I'm up here, so I might as well. Sync will be your way of controlling the story. You will make the choices for your hero. When your hero is confronted with a choice, like save a hot girl or save an old man, you get to make that choice for him. You will click, and you get to watch the movie you want to make. Every one minute, there will be a choice. And then you can go back and watch the movie from completely different set of choices. It's going to be great. Well, as of now, it looks like this, because I'm still fixing it, working it up. But the idea of it is it, it seeks to evolve storytelling from, from a linear system, you know, beginning, middle, end, you know, all the way to a circular system, the way Joseph Campbell proposed it, all the way to an open system. And I know I've talked a lot about a lot of things, um, but what I mostly want to, you know, Get away from all this is the fact that the future of storytelling is going to be a future where all of you are going to actively participate in the way stories are structured, filmed, told, perceived, and experienced. And this is everything. You um, feel free to continue this conversation with me. This is my website. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for this. I know this has been a lot of just like me talking about things, uh, but thank you for everything. And you know, the future is so, so close to us right now. Let's go.